just going to take about five to 10 seconds here to push live to YouTube and LinkedIn. All right, and we have some folks joining in the chat here. Welcome. Right, we are live on uh, YouTube here. Just double check LinkedIn. Yep, and we are also live on LinkedIn. Awesome. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. As you are hopping online here, uh, drop where you're tuning in from below in the comments. Awesome. All right, we have an awesome discussion today as part of our Delta Lake Deep Dive series. Uh, our next guest is Vitor uh, with Viva Systems, and Vitor will be discussing everything liquid clustering uh, today with Vitor's uh, background in data engineering and in his current role as a data platform engineer uh, at Viva. He is bringing a wealth of knowledge and experience today. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. Uh, so if you are tuning in, I'm so sorry. Sorry about that. If you are uh, tuning in today, you are going to be learning a lot about liquid clustering. We have uh, a few folks here that are going to be joining us on the question side. Uh, we'll be doing Q&A at the end of today's session, but if you have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the LinkedIn, YouTube, or Zoom chat, wherever you are tuning in uh, today from. Awesome. And without further ado, I will pass things over to Vitor, uh, if you'd like to share your screen for today. Yeah, sure. Can you see it? Awesome. I can see it on my oh. end. So yeah, um, hello everyone. And thank you for joining me today on Delta Lake Deep Dive. Uh, my name is Vitor Teixeira. I work at Viva Systems as a data platform engineer. And today I will talk about liquid clustering in Delta Lake and, and the road so far. So first, let me give you a quick introduction on the problem it's trying to solve. So the ever-increasing volumes of data in our platforms um, demand a lot of performance. Um, querying very large data sets is not an easy task, and there is a lot of work involved in optimizing query performance. Query performance that is highly dictated by the amount of information that we need to read. So it is very important that we do not read unnecessary information, that it will not be part of the, re the results of our queries, um, nor information that is very spread out across small files. So the goal here is to read the most relevant files with the most appropriate size. And that can be accomplished using several techniques that I will detail throughout this presentation. So what are we going to be covering today? We'll go through the different techniques that can be used to improve query performance by organizing data in a certain way. How do they work? How can we use them and their own limitations? Uh, we will start with the traditional lifestyle partitioning where data is physically separated depending on partition columns values. Then we'll talk about file statistics and how can they be leveraged to avoid reading unnecessary files. And then we will go through space filling curves, uh, namely Z order, um, and the new awesome feature called liquid clustering that will simplify the way we organize our data so that we get more performance with less work. All right, so I've style partitioning. This is a partitioning strategy in which files are stored under different folders according to their specific partition values. Here we have an example of a data set that contains users and is partitioned on the country column. Our partitioning works is pretty simple. 
Um, when writing it to a partition table, the partition columns are excluded from the final schema because the column name and value can be derived from the path and the data is written into the appropriate folders. For instance, um, if we have a user record from Portugal, which schema is an ID in a country, we would end up with a parquet file containing the ID inside a folder with a key and partition value, pretty much like we see in the image. When reading back the data, we read it from the base path, in this case, the users folder, and the data source automatically deals with inserting the partition columns back into the schema. This is called partition discovery. So getting back to the example, let's say we need to fetch all the users that are from Portugal. Um, if we have it partitioned by country, we avoid having to read other countries' data because Spark will make use of the partition filters and will only select the files under the relevant folder. So lifestyle partitioning can be very useful, especially for huge tables. Um, this strategy can work well in some cases, but it needs to be thought up front as data distribution needs to be known beforehand. Um, only partition columns with very few cardinalities should be used, something like countries or, or gender, which have a rather small set of possible values. And um, it's also recommended to use partitioning on really big tables, as I said something around the size of terabytes with partitions bigger than a gigabyte. Regarding limitations, um, one is that if we pick a high cardinality column, like let's say zip codes, it can generate a lot of small files and this will result in a very poor scan performance. Um, so the fewer files to read, the better. Another limitation is that these partition columns are not very flexible, as if we need to change them, we need to rewrite the whole data, which can be very expensive. Another technique that is used for data skipping is collecting file statistics and use them to be able to safely ignore files that are not worth reading. So from Delta Lake 1.2, um, data sk skipping statistics are automatically collected when we write data into a Delta table. In the slide, we have an example of an add action that contains all the collected statistics for the file. We use information like mean and max values for each file, and this is the information that it is used to reason about whether or not we should skip a file when reading. We also need to, to have in mind that only the first 32 columns have their statistics collected, uh, which is configurable by the property data skipping num index calls. And when querying the table, files are automatically skipped when applicable. So no configuration is needed for that. Regarding stats collection, um, is more effective on keys, numbers, and, and high cardinality predicates. So a, a good practice is to move these to the left to make sure their stats are collected. Um, and on the other hand, long strings should be moved all the way to the right past the configured value. So the reason for this is that uh, we only want to collect stats that will benefit our queries and long R to compare strings will only slow down the collection process uh, while bringing little to no benefit. So essentially, what we want to do is structure our data in a way that maximizes data skipping. Here we have an example that showcases just that. Let's say we want to um, get the first 20,000 IDs. In principle, if we range partitioned our files by the ID column, we would have effective data skipping as every file um, would contain a disjoint set of IDs, so we could filter the relevant file for our query and avoid reading all the rest. Um, but what if we want to add a few more predicates? Like, is, is this approach enough to an effective data skipping? The answer is no. So let's add a new predicate that also gets users that have a, a balance greater than 40,000. Here we see that the linearity from, from the pre previous example kind of falls apart um, as we have a lot of overlapping in the balances column. So we end up having to read all the files just to satisfy this predicate. If two or more columns are, are related, a, a natural clustering can happen. So it can work for more columns as well, but not for unrelated ones. So how do we solve this issue of uh, grouping multiple statistics into a single dimension? So it just works. 
that's when the ordering comes to rescue. The order will organize our data in a way that makes file skipping effective and thus improving query speed. Uh, what you see in the in the little box is an example uh, of the Z order curve, which is a space filling curve. A space filling curve uh, is a curve that traverses all the points in a higher dimensional space. This this might sound complex, but you can imagine it like being a thread that goes through all the points uh, just once. We have this this little box here with four points, and we have the 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 Z order, the the Z shaped uh, line that goes through all the points. The order allows mapping these higher dimensional points into a single dimension while maintaining proximity in the original space. What this means is that we are able to safely encode our information in a single value and use it to compare similarity. This feature is available since Delta 2.0 and is a technique that is used to place related information, uh, multidimensional, in the same set of files. This makes it possible for statistics to be more effective since the, um, the records with similar values are grouped under the same files. So the, the whole goal of the ordering is, is to reduce the intersection of the, um, of the data ranges between files by taking several columns as an input and mapping them to a specific point in a z-order curve. To use it, um, we need to run an optimized command and specify that we want to use the order with a list of columns uh, similar to the example in the note. Regarding uh, the general approach for the ordering, um, we should use it on joint keys or frequently queried columns, either primary or foreign keys on dimension and fact tables, ID fields, or um, I cardinality fields that are frequently used on our queries. And these columns should be part of the ones that have their statistics collected. Uh, otherwise, you won't work. And we also need to take into account that the, um, the overall effectiveness of the algorithm drops as more columns are added. So it is not a good practice to the order by a lot of columns. In the next slide, we will see a, a simplified example on how it works internally. So in this example, we have six records with two unrelated columns. We, we can assume it's ID and balance as, as the previous example that will be divided into three partitions. So the first step is to sample the data set and attribute a range ID to each of the Z order columns. This way we only deal with integers and get a good enough grouping of the data. In the next step, we will convert each of these integers that form uh, coordinates to bytes and interleave them. So in interleaving is the step that transforms the, the multidimensional coordinates into a single dimension. And then if we convert these values back to decimal, we get the final z-order value. And then we are finally able to, to group the files together in a way that minimizes the overlap of, of statistics. However, um, the order has several limitations. So first is that optimize the order by rewrites all the data in the table when executed, uh, which results in a very high write amplification as it does not take into account any already clustered data. Secondly, for really large tables, rewriting all the data can be very expensive and, and time consuming. So if there is any issue during its execution, it needs to start from the beginning as, as it runs as a single operation. In addition to this, the other columns need to be specified every time we want to run optimize the order by, as there is no table level definition. So without this, we are not able to define the columns outside the optimize command, and even more importantly, retrieve the current ones. Lastly, while the order curves are relatively good at preserving locality, they are not perfect at preserving it. So locality means that if two points are closed in a higher dimension, they should also be closed together along the z-order curve. However, this curve is, is not contiguous. Um, for each successive point of the curve, the distance is not always one. We can take the, the example of the two yellow points with coordinates 3, 1 and, and 0, 2. So they come one after another and they are very different, meaning 
the two Z ordered points that are sequential can generate a file that contains a wide range of values, uh, making data skipping ineffective. And finally, we have liquid clustering. So this can be seen as an improved version of the order that uses Hilbert curves and with a new concept called ZQ that enables incremental clustering. So starting with the first difference, the Hilbert curve. This curve is, is a lot harder to compute compared to the simple bit interleaving of the order. Um, the simplest form of the curve can be represented in four different ways each one with a different orientation uh, labeled A to D in this image. And um, pairing this with what we call a, a, straight, a state transition table will, uh, will enable us to build Hilbert curves with different sizes. There are several algorithms documented in the literature, but the current proposal uses state transition tables. And these tables are automatically generated using some complex calculations. And with them, we are able to encode multidimensional coordinates into points on the Hilbert curve and the other way around, retrieving coordinates from a certain point in the curve. So in the next slide, we'll go through two iterations of this algorithm to generate a second order curve as we see in the image. So we first start with one of the basic shapes, A, B, C, or D. In this example, we started by drawing each point of the shape with label A and follow through all the points while respecting the orientation. We go through zero, then one, two, and three, and that pretty much concludes the first iteration of the curve as we see here. For the second iteration of the curve, for each point of the first order curve, we are going to start a second order curve that will follow the rules of the state transition table. So uh, for the first point, which is 0, 0 of the A labeled curve, we can see that the next state is the, the curve labeled D. So we go to this point, the first one, and draw the curve uh, there, and then follow up to the next point. So the, the next point in, in the A curve is 1 uh, with coordinates 0, 1, and we see that it is connected to itself. So we go to the second point and draw the same a labeled curve there. And then we repeat this for all the other points until we reach the end and we end up with something like this. So this is the final look of our second order Z order curve, Z, sorry, Hilbert curve. Um, if we wanted to encode more information, we, we could continue to the next iteration just by using the same method. So you still, you still might be wondering, like, why do all this work? Like, wh what is the benefit? If you remember back in the Z order section, I, I mentioned that Z order curves are not very good at preserving locality due to jumps along its path. That does not happen with the Hilbert curve, as you might have noticed, as this curve has a, a very cool property that each of the successive points along the curve have the same distance of one. This makes it much better at preserving locality compared to the Z order curve. Okay, now it's time for the next change, incremental clustering. So Z order had the issue of not being very flexible. Um, it reclusters already clustered data, and there is no intermediate checkpointing. In order to solve that, Liquid introduced the concept of Z cubes. Z cubes are nothing more than groups of files that are produced by the same optimized job and these files will get a zcube ID tag appended to their metadata that is used to identify between optimized and unoptimized files so that we uh, avoid clustering already well clustered files. Clustering columns are now also part of the metadata for each file. And the reason for this is that we, when we change clustering columns, we don't want to consider these files for re-optimization. We will get to this point later in the presentation. So regarding ZQ's properties, they can have two different states. They can be partial when its files combined size is less than the configured mean cube size or stable when it's greater. The, the default for, for this configuration is 100 gigabytes. Then we have target size for, for, um, for ZQ and it's defined um, as target cube size, which is a soft maximum size that defaults to 150 gigabytes. 
what happens is that the, the cubes will have files appended to them until they go past this threshold. Also, there is another interesting property. Z cubes can also have their state being downgraded if a couple of delete operations make their combined size less than mean cube size again. We'll get to why these states matter in a moment. So the other difference is that clustering columns are now part of the table definition instead of uh, part of the optimized command. This means that when we create a liquid table, we need to specify the list of columns we want to cluster in the cluster by predicate, and we can choose up to four. Th this information will be stored in the transaction log as a domain metadata action, and it acts like an indicator that the table is, is using liquid clustering. So regarding clustering columns, there are several allowed changes. They can be modified by running alter table cluster by with a list of columns. Um, have in mind that the next optimized jobs will not consider these files as they have different clustering columns. So these files will not be altered. And we also need to be aware that if we add a new column to the clustering list, it should be inside the range of columns that have their statistics collected, pretty much like the order. They can also be renamed using alter table rename column command, but only if column mapping is enabled. Regarding deletions, uh, if we need to delete all the clustering columns, we can run alter table cluster by none, and that will make next optimized jobs completely disregard uh, clustering columns. In addition to this, if we need to delete a column from the schema that is currently a clustering column, we must first drop them from the cluster by list, and then we are able to drop it from the schema. So now that let's take a look at how it works in practice that we know, um, now that we know all the features that make up liquid clustering. So this represents the flow of uh, an optimized command with liquid clustering. And contrary to optimize the order by, we don't need to manually specify the clustering columns anymore. So after we run the command, there is a phase where uh, candidate files are picked. And this is where states will matter as the files that are picked for optimizations will be the new ones that are still not part of any ZQ and the partial ZQs, the ones that do not meet the size requirements. So after that, the clustering algorithm is applied. And for each generated ZQ, an optimized job will be created for which a, a new entry in the delta log will be generated. This means that if there is any issue between any uh, ZQ generation, all the previous work is not lost and it can basically resume from, from where it failed. So to sum it all up, we have uh, clustering columns as a table level definition. We have a new curve that improves the clustering and we have incremental clustering with ZQs. Pretty awesome upgrade. Now, some important notes regarding Liquid. Um, this feature is not compatible with the previous strategies. I've style partitioning and the order. So in order to use it, we need to create a table using a projection of the old one. Also, the, the recommendation is to use Liquid for all new tables and use partitions and the order columns as Liquid clustering columns. Liquid uh, also makes use of Delta features that enforce writer version 7 and reader version 3. So be careful if both writers and readers support those versions before you try to upgrade your tables. And finally, um, liquid cluster tables will not allow uh, optimize the order by. And that is because uh, it, it needs to prevent users from running the order because they don't know the table is, is currently clustered using liquid. So yeah, that's it. I, I hope you found this presentation informative. And if you have any question, feel free to ask. Um, I did not have the chance to, to use Liquid in production, nor I have all the answers, but take the opportunity to, to ask some questions as we have some, some Databricks folks here to shed some more light on the topic. Um, thank you. And thanks to Carly and Danny for, for the opportunity to present to you all today. 
Vitor, thanks very much. Really appreciate uh, you doing this wonderful presentation. So uh, we've got some questions coming in, but uh, to the folks that are on LinkedIn specifically, some of those questions are coming through and some of them are not. So we've been trying to refresh it. So just to let you know, we are actually not trying to avoid your questions. It's that in some cases we're seeing them, in some cases we're not. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the other Brickster folks to uh, jump on board and uh, turn on their cameras and to introduce themselves. So um, some of you already know who I'm. I'm Denny. I'm a Delta Lake maintainer. Um, that's all you need <laughs> for me. So that's perfectly fine. Rahul, why don't you introduce yourself and then uh, uh, we'll go from there. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Rahul. I'm an engineer uh, at Databricks and uh, I work on uh, Delta Lake for the last four years. Siri? Yeah, hey everyone, I'm Siri. I'm a product manager at Databricks, uh, working on the storage side of the house and uh, Liquid specifically. Thanks for jumping on. Excellent. So um, I'm going to go through and try to find some of the LinkedIn questions. But um, like I said, uh, please go ahead and try to keep asking us because they're not coming through. Um, Carly, if you can do me a small favor and try to post the Zoom link directly in LinkedIn while we're doing this. So that way, uh, potentially, you can just join us in Zoom and just ask your questions here as well. Uh, the one that was sort of prominent um, that I think all three of us actually tried to answer the question because it didn't come, to, it all showed up at weird times. Um, the first one is for Hive style, par uh, when it, we're talking about Hive style partitioning, okay, the precursor here to liquid clustering, um, can you actually add new partitions without uh, uh, um, without actually doing any overwrites. And so uh, I'll let you guys go ahead and answer those questions first. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, so when you, when you have like new data that's being ingested to the table, as long as it follows the same partitioning scheme as, it, as what the table is defined with, uh, you don't need to overwrite the table. But uh, if you want to change the partitioning scheme of the table, let's say you had year uh, as the partitioning column, and then you later decided that you wanted to be month and uh, day. In that case, you'll need to overwrite the table. Uh, whereas with liquid, uh, you can uh, like evolve your uh, clustering columns without overwriting the entire table. Perfect. Thank you very much. Now. Here's where the, uh, the I think, I, literally LinkedIn popped up. So thank you, everybody on LinkedIn, for going and chiming in real fast. Uh, there is a question here, which I'm going to keep it open to everybody, which is, what's the uh, best approach for moving the existing, your existing partition tables, delta tables, to liquid clustering? Uh, lots of people are wondering how to do that migration, how that transition. So I'm going to open again the board for anybody here to go ahead and chime in on that. Yeah, it's a really good question. So we get really frequently. Uh, so right now, because partitioning and liquid clustering are so radically different, right now the approach is going to be you, you kind of have to rewrite your data from partitioning to liquid clustering. Uh, down the road, we are working on making that easier. Like we'd love to see there be a smooth path uh, between the two, uh, but that's the state of the art today. Cool, cool, cool. And then uh, one of my favorite type of questions, so uh, is that, is there a Python variant to creating a table with liquid clustering? Um, again, anybody wants to answer that? And then I, I, I'm I, going to have a follow-up to that question, <laughs> that answer. But please go ahead and somebody chime in first before I do my follow-up. It's uh, a great question. I, so we're sub going to be supporting uh, all the APIs which uh, allow table definition and uh, and DML, basically the data frame APIs and the Delta table APIs. So, and they are already available in Python, SQL, and Scala. So, we're just going to be piggybacking on the same API. So, yeah, to answer your question, yes, it should work in Python as well once released. Right. And and so to add to what Rahul is saying is that there's a number, amount of work that's being done with the Delta Rust API and the Python bindings that go with it. Okay. And so right now, if you go ahead and look at our the roadmap, we've we've pr pretty much clarified that, you know, we've got a bunch of work on the kernel project uh, that we're trying to work together to simplify that process, as well as various features. And to exactly what Rahul is calling it, it's actually definitely on the top of our list of um it's not the top of our list, but it's near the top of our list of things specifically for Python now. Um, by the same token, 
uh, this is not me to just evade that particular question. If you uh, want to uh, pro help us prioritize this more, please go to the Delta Lake um, GitHub, excuse me, uh, just go to go.delta.io slash GitHub. And you can literally choose the Delta Rust roadmap there and literally vote on that at particular issue. So we're going to, because we can get a lot of traction. Because the main reason why the other issues have been targeted first is just because those are the ones that the community asked for first. So if there is actually, as we're going through the regular roadmap iterations that we do, if, you, if, if liquid clustering specifically for Python is what is required first, yeah, please vote for that because that's actually how we as a community get that feedback to figure out how we prioritize these different things. Okay, so just want to call that out. All right, uh, let's see. Um, what else? Oh, okay. All right, so we're going all Uber tech, so which is great. I love these type of questions. So um, Hamid has asked us a question. Within a file, I'm presuming within the context of a parquet file, do you have a concept of row groups with the associated metadata? And if yes, how do those row groups math, uh, map to the Z order clusters? Anybody want to tackle yeah, that I can take one? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so again, a great question. So today, uh, all, all the uh, Z order or like any of the optimizations we do is not going to be within a file. Uh, it's going to be across files. You're going to have uh, like what Vitor was explaining, different uh, statistics. Uh, within a file, we we, we do not uh, like sort the row groups or arrange the row groups in any ways uh, uh, differently. So the reason for this is the files are already granular enough that they give you uh, great performance. And the row group sizes are... You you're going to be doing a lot more work basically to like uh, with with very less uh, improvements if you want to like uh, divide the row groups within a file and cluster them together. Thanks very much, Raul. That that's very helpful. Yes, uh, there's always these discussions when it comes to internals around the parquet um, structure and how we associate that with the statistics. For example, there's another question which is related to exactly what you talked about here, Rahul, uh, that if, for example, I, if I have ID columns that are good values, uh, do you click statistics, things of that nature? And the whole point is that some of that stuff is, abs is we look at the stuff from the standpoint of the whole system, not like literally file by file. There, there are obviously, there's some advantages to it. And so we definitely look at the tail of the FARK files to help us with that. But the whole point is that we have to, when we when it comes to doing things broader, like especially when it comes to the Z order, you have to look at the whole thing. You can't just look at file by file. Uh, it, it doesn't really <laughs> give your context, basically. So um, let's see, what else? Um, answer those. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. I completely missed the uh, question from YouTube. Um, the, oh, bummer. Sorry. Uh, whoever had asked in YouTube, I literally saw somebody chime in, and then I it unfortunately disappeared. So um my apologies um for the attendee uh who is um uh, who's raised their voice uh raised their hand on um on zoom can you please go ahead and um uh, uh um was it uh chime in the q a because we don't actually turn on chat uh specifically in these sessions so but if you put the question in q a we can we can definitely answer it uh Vitor, but you are here, so I think you had a question. So by all means, go for it, uh, because this is a great time for you as a Delta Lake yeah. uh, contributor to actually ask questions from the <laughs> from the engineers and PMs live. I, 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 so please go ahead. Yeah. So my first question is: um, Are there any plans to cluster data on write using uh, the Liquid capabilities, or just by running Optimize? Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, so yeah, th that is planned. Uh, in fact, we already do this to a certain extent today. Um, but we obviously don't want to overdo it because that would uh, bear the risk of slowing your rights to a crawl. And so I think the, the mental model that we want to work towards is that we would sort of eagerly cluster what we can uh, on write. But then later on, if you want sort of the full globally optimal clustering, that you would then run the optimize command. Oh, I have another one. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, Ryan, there... let, me, let me just add to uh, the, that context yeah. here. Um, one of the things that we often forget about is the context of streaming, right? 
And so it's a commonly normal approach that we're streaming data in. So exactly as was being called out, if we do too much optimizations, what we look, that is exactly that context of saying, we're gonna uh, slow the rights down to a crawl. And since it's streaming, <laughs> we definitely don't wanna do that. So that's part of the reason to trying to find that right balance of how much do we wanna do it during that particular right and how much we wanna do it during the optimize. So I just wanted to call that little tidbit out, that's all. Yeah, I, I, I compare it to like, you want to brush your teeth every day, but you don't want to spend too much time doing it. But then every once in a while, you also want to go to the dentist for a full checkup. Well, I love that particular one. Do you have to bring up the dentist now, man? Seriously. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> but, but more fun. But more fun. <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. find a funner one, man. No. <laughs> Sorry, Vitor. Uh, please, Vitor, uh, please go ahead and ask your other question. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's a, that was a good one. Um, my other question is... Um, is there any way we can force a whole recluster of the data after we've been changing clustering columns for a while? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, we're working on it. This is on our backlog. So actually today, uh, when you change the clustering columns, um, uh, we don't yet have a way where you can tell us go and cluster the old data that was clustered using the old clustering columns using the new clustering columns. Uh, but uh, I think as early as uh next quarter we're hoping to have that and so you it'll probably be sort of an add-on command to optimize where you can say not only optimize uh the recent data but also just go back in time and do it retroactively cool thank you yeah great question but yeah we definitely want to get to this model where uh you know you're very flexible on your clustering columns like you can change them uh as query patterns change and then optionally you can kind of go back and, and do it for historical data. Yeah, actually, I think that's sort of related to the LinkedIn. I'm trying, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get the context out of uh, Luis's question within LinkedIn. Uh, um, basically, I think they were running into issues or they, while they're, everything's on Delta and they're investigating liquid clustering, uh, they've uh, encountered some challenges. And so I think that's the idea that can you, uh, the needing to recreate. And I think you had already answered that question earlier on. It's like, we will eventually work on trying to simplify that process. But right now, due to the inherent complexities, it's, uh, it is about creating a new table as opposed to trying to, uh, it, the, your migration is creating a new table as opposed to going ahead and trying to do an alter table. Uh, did I sort of cover that correctly or do did I, am I missing any context here? I'm getting nods. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, <laughs> yeah. no, I think that's good. I think, I think that's right. Cool, cool, cool. All right, perfect. Um, all right, last few minutes. If there are any other questions, please chime in. Otherwise than that, I don't want to waste any of y'all time. Um, but the the questions that came in were great. So, uh, and then oh, since uh, uh if you want to dive deeper into some of these things, you don't feel comfortable, or we missed it because the LinkedIn was acting up a little weird on us again. Um. Don't forget, all of us are on the Delta user Slack, uh, go.delta.io slash Slack. That's how you join. And then literally all of us are here uh, to answer questions. So glad to do that. Um, oh, thank you, Carly, for chiming in. So it uh, looks like I think that's, oh, uh, I think, There's, yeah, that's it. Oh, was there another one that I missed? Sorry. There was one more question from Nial on how much does the ordering of the clustering columns matter? Sweet. Let's do it. Uh so yeah, I, I think in general, uh, aspirationally, we would like for them not to matter. Uh, but the truth is they, they do matter a little bit. Uh, and so in general, a good uh, a good best practice would be uh, if you have a column, you know, among your clustering columns, if you have cl columns that are more important, that are more frequently queried, for example, that we'd kind of recommend you put those first. Uh, I, you know, as the liquid project evolves over time, we, we hope to not have to say that anymore, but that uh, remains a best practice for now. Cool. Uh, do you see other questions? I don't, but maybe. Uh, and I just did another. I just did another refresh again, so okay. I'm not seeing questions. So, but do I you get questions? The one thing maybe I'll end on is, is Hamid had a okay. good question earlier on around: Do you support sort of part uh, clustering in Liquid against, let's say, prefixes of, uh, of of fields like like zip codes, parts of the zip code, or even writing functions to, uh, you know kind of take a column and kind of bucket it down into smaller uh, sets. Um, Rahul had a good answer. I think another answer is, you know, you don't actually have to do this anymore with Liquid. 
So traditionally, you would do this with partitioning because you were afraid of high cardinality values because we would create a new file for each value. So if you had something like a timestamp, a very granular timestamp, you would have to write your own function to say, let's like strip off everything but the date. And, so, and uh, otherwise we would create like a million tiny files, like one for each timestamp. Liquid though is actually smart enough to not need that anymore. So you can just cluster against your high cardinality timestamp and Liquid is gonna cluster your, your various files appropriately. Maybe one file has all the timestamps from you know date range X to Y. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it's kind of a, a, a paradigm shift. Like you don't have to think about, do I have to bucket or reduce cardinality anymore? And it's one of the great things with Liquid. So uh, may, maybe of all the questions, I wanted to end on that because it's actually, it's a, it's a really big <laughs> value prop for Liquid. And uh, I think it's a great uh, example of how it's better than Hive style partitioning. Perfect. Well, then I think this is a great way to end it. Uh, you, you called it out, so let's do it. Uh, it. Again, if you have any more questions, by all means, please chime in on the Delta user Slack that Carly already uh, shared. And uh, we'll see you guys uh, at the next session. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a good one.